What a wonderful day that we get to worship our God. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 1 says, Oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name, for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. Verse 4, Isaiah chapter 25, for you have been a defense for the helpless, a defense for the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a rain just against a wall. Isaiah, or our first song will be, Our God, He is Alive. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He is disguised with heavenly hue and frame the world with his great mind. There is a God, he is alive. From the star God, he created man, he is our God, the great I am. Our God, you son upon a tree, a lot was will in the tree. That he from sin might set man free and evermore with him to live. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. Good morning and welcome to the Olympic Church of Christ. July 31st, whoo, this month's been, been a long one. But we are tomorrow going into the month of August and this last day of this month uh, the, of the Lord's Day, our announcements are as followed. This service is being live streamed for those not attending in person. People in cars, in the parking lot, you can tune in to 88.7 FM to hear the service. Uh, the church do ask that you do not use the church Wi-Fi during the stream so that uh, our stream, uh, the church's stream can be a lot stronger. Uh, we also have search TV program on channel 11, Sunday, 7 a.m., channel 22, Sunday at 8 a.m., and Wednesday, 10.30 a.m., and Friday at 8.30 a.m. In-person classes for Sunday morning and Wednesday night service. Sunday morning classes, uh, morning classes at 9.30 a.m. and it's taught by uh, Gary Tamor and it's on the book of Joshua. Uh, the Sunday youth class is also at 9.30 and it's taught by G. Wu and he is now going over personal faith. The Wednesday night uh, adult teen class is at 7 uh, p.m. with Jiwu, and they're going through the uh, book of 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And also, I have a note uh, when you join by uh, uh, Zoom, that you would uh, please uh, mute yourself. I guess they're having some problems with some folks not being muted at, uh, at times. So when you go on, click on that little microphone at the bottom to mute yourself right away. Uh, see the e-bulletin for links and passwords to the Zooms for the above classes. Mask wearing, the elders have determined that mask wearing is optional for all 
who are vaccinated, this is a personal choice that you make. Uh, but those who are not vaccinated, they do ask that you still please wear your mask. Uh, Three Minute Thursday, a devotional from Don and Adam, I'm sorry, Don and Jiwu videos on Facebook available each week. Uh, and you can see the bulletin uh, for the details on those. Um, the announcements and the calendar for the week. Uh, my favorite, a family bike ride. There will be a family bike ride Saturday, August 6th. Uh, it's on the Chehalis Bike Trail at 10.30 a.m. And you can see GU for that, uh, for more details on that. Uh, so church family, you can uh, get those bikes out of the garage, dust them off, and don't get rid of them like Vincent did. And, uh, and pump up the tires and, you know, meet at the 41st uh, Street Avenue uh, entrance as a parking area. And, you know, go out and see the nature that God has uh, created. I'll tell you, you know, I do a lot of cycling and you see a lot of what God's created. There's, there's times when I'm out there by myself and, uh, you know, my mind is thinking and all of a sudden I go, look what the Lord has made. I mean, you don't see it from a car. So uh, plan on getting out there as a family and, you know, as a church family and seeing what God has created. The outreach, pro, outreach opportunity, Jiwu and Bonnie are seeking volunteers to distribute door hangers in our community. Uh, we plan on meeting in the auditorium after the AM service on August 7th and go out from there. See, please see Jiwu or Bonnie if you have more questions. And that's another opportunity for us as a church to get out and reach other people. So it's really a good thing to do. And uh, the last thing, um, our brother Nick Jones is being considered as a deacon. So Nick, if you'll stand up, you and your lovely wife. The congregation has two weeks to give their input and any scriptural objections to him being installed as a deacon. So that's Nick and his wife. So that's who you'll be considering. So thank you, Nick, for standing. Uh, appreciate it. If you will, go to our Lord in prayer so we may open our service this morning. Our most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, Lord, it's always an, an honor, Lord, to, to come before you each and every day. But Father, it's even more special when we come together as a congregation, Lord, here to serve you as uh, like-minded believers. And Father God, we just ask that as we participate in this service this morning, Lord, where we come together and worship you and sing songs and, and learn more how we may serve you, that that, Lord, that you would give us the wisdom, give us the strength, give us the power, Father, to, to honor you and serve you in the right manner. And that, Lord God, the speaker this morning, that the things that you've placed upon his heart, that he would share them with us and that, Father, that we will accept them and know that, uh, Lord, this is how we should live according to your will and your way. So we ask that your spirit is present here in this service this morning. Let us not do anything Father, that will not bring you honor and glory. This we pray in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Night with heaven
Good morning. Good morning. So I was just um, actually thinking about it this morning as I was going through and talking about my upcoming couple of months and when I'm going to be here and not be here. And I was reminded about just how lucky we actually are to be able to come together. Um, the multiple reasons why I was sitting there thinking, and I'm sure it's, this is going to, you're going to have to try to connect the dots with me. But um, for six months, I was in Mongolia, as most of you know. And it's hard to believe that Jesus is not known everywhere to everybody. You know, I was sitting out in this town, it was called Nilach, and um, the town was probably had about 1,700 people in it. All of them were, their richest would have been considered, you know, impoverished in our country. And I was talking to this guy, his name was Shuri Tinzeg, and um, he was asking me if I wanted to go out drinking with him. I'm like, you know, I, it's not my thing, right? And he's like, well, why not? I was like, well, one, it's not good for my body. Two, I'm a Christian. And it's like I, it's like I smacked him on the side of the head. He's like a Christian, right? And here he is. He's probably 22, 23 years old. You know, his English is pretty good. And, you know, he, uh, he taught himself English by watching HBO. And um, I was like, how does this man not know the story of Christ? And just to watch it click in his, in his eyes and to, see the, and to see how excited he was to talk about it. And he's like, well, what can you tell me about? And obviously, you know, I started going through like the gospel and explaining it. And then when I got to the, when I got to, you know, the, the week, you know, leading up to the crucifixion, it was such a powerful moment for him that he was like, tell me more, tell me more. And I wish that we would have had, you know, months and months to be able to sit down and study with them. But, you know, Christianity is still not an approved religion in that country. Um, there is four churches. Uh, there's four churches that are there and they're all Catholic and, um, but they're not allowed to come together and worship. And if I think, you know, in those, in those last hours, in those last days with Jesus, it was very similar to what's going on in the country. And here we are together and we got this wonderful building and we are able to stream services all across the world. I was watching tomorrow is when I'd be watching the services here. And, you know, we have, we're able to, to come together and we don't have to worry about locking the doors. We don't have to worry about keeping our voices low. And it is such a blessing that I know that I take for, for granted that we're able to come here, we're able to do this. You know, it's not a chore. It's something that, you know, we're excited about. This morning, you know, Lotus, as you guys know, she, um, she just took, um, she was just baptized two weeks ago and she just took the Lord's Supper for the first time with all of us um, last week. And she was disappointed that she couldn't be here with us today. And it's like, how, how awesome is that? You know, that someone's disappointed that they can't come together with their brothers and sisters, you know, to, to one, worship. And then secondly, to, to be able to, celebrating the memorial and you know, that leads to like what does the lord's supper mean and it means something different to every one of us but you know scripturally to me it means that we're going to remember something we're going to memorialize something we're going to fellowship with one another and we're going to have strength the lord's supper reminds us of jesus's presence with us in matthew 26 29 it said but i say to you i will not drink of the this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then further on in 1820, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. This verse also would also apply to the communion. His presence with us is real, but not in his physical body. He's with us in spirit and in truth. In Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And like I was saying, it's a time for us to fellowship and come together. It says in Corinthians 10, 16, 17, the cup of blessings which we bless is not the communion of the blood. I'm sorry, the cup of blessings which we bless is, is it not the communion of blood of Christ? For the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body. For we all partake of that one bread. We declare our unity based upon Christ as the head of our body. And then lastly, as I was talking about the strength, I go, I go through work, and as many of us know, work can sometimes be challenging, just like school. You know, I remember a gentleman was sitting here telling Lotus, guard yourself, guard yourself, because school is going to be a place that you're challenged. And work for me is a very, very, very challenging place. I walk in, and it's, it's like, I don't know what happens to common sense and acting right, but it goes out the door when I walk, when I walk in there. You know, I'm surrounded by a lot of things of this world, and, you know, although I'm there, but I'm not of the world. And it's challenging. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, I have the, the nicest mouth all the time, especially with the job that I have. There's, there's quite a lot of, time, a lot of times that that boss hunting is doing some directing. And sometimes I need to use some words to grab some attention. But the strength that I have when I come together, I'm re-encouraged to go back out there and, fit, and face the world again. In Corinthians, in the first Corinthians 11, 27 through 30, it says, therefore, who eats this bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in any unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and may sleep. So for me, coming in here, I'm, I'm refilling my fuel tank right now. I'm, I'm going to the gas station. I'm refilling my fuel tank. I'm able to to recalibrate myself so that as I do participate in the Lord's Supper, I'm arming myself to go back out into the next time that we can come together and we can do this. If you'd please now go to God with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so very thankful for you. We are thankful for all that you've given to us and all the, all the glory that we're able to see every day. We're very, very grateful that we live in a country that we can come together and we can, and we can sing and we can leave the doors open and we can profess your name. Lord, we are extremely unworthy of the, of the sacrifice that was given on the cross. But Lord, we thank you so very much for it. Lord, I pray that as we take of this bread, which is symbolic of the body that was broken, that we would all do so in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. We ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. I apologize. I'm still trying to work through these phone, the doing the thing off my phone. A lot of people are better at it than I am, though. In 1 Corinthians 10:21 says, "You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table." and the table of demons. It belongs to the Lord. It is by his authority. The importance is what is on the table. And the blood that was, the blood that was shed, there's a song, you know, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And, and again, I think I've said it before. I'm a very visual person. And I think that the reason why the, the communion is so important to me is because of, of the blood that was shed. And to me, I, it, it chokes me up to realize that, that in, my, in, my, in my worst, I was still loved enough, right? And, and that no matter what, no matter if I can't forgive myself or, you know, there's going to be times where Zephyr and Lotus, they're not going to forgive me because I didn't let them play the video game or I didn't do X, Y, and Z. But no matter what, that I am forgiven. And then to me, that, that is amazing. And it is such a blessing that we have the opportunity. So if we could please uh, pray over the cup. Lord, your, your blood washes away our sin. Lord, and we are thankful for that. The, the love that you've, that you've showered us with is one that we, we don't deserve, but we're thankful for it. Lord, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which is symbolic of the blood that was shed, I would ask that we would remind ourselves that 
we don't need to beat ourselves up when we fall short and that we are loved and that we are forgiven and that our past transgressions are forgiven and that we have repentance. Lord, I ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Now, out of convenience, we will, um, separate from the Lord's Supper, we'll take the collection. And as, as we've transitioned through the pandemic, there's multiple ways to give. There's um, a wall on the back of the building. There is um, electronic funds transfers. I think that's what EFT stands for. There is checks. There's all sorts of ways to give. But the most important way that we can give is doing it with a cheerful heart, knowing that we will never, ever outgive God and the blessings that he's bestowed upon us. It is, um, the church does a lot of great work in benevolence, not only for ourselves, but outside in our community. And I would ask that as we do prepare to give and that as we do give week to week, we do so and we'd be cheerful about it. And remembering that, that just because you may not be able to afford that $8 cup of Starbucks, you know, God's going to pour it back onto you tenfold. So Heavenly Father, Lord, you've blessed us with so much more than we'll ever be able to pay back. Lord, as we collect these funds, I'd ask that they'd be used to, to further your kingdom and that the elders and the deacons, and they would, they would distribute it accordingly and to the way that you see fit, Lord. I pray that we would all be able to give with a cheerful heart and that those, those givings would, would grow your kingdom and that they would ease people's needs where needed and that you'd continue to be able to allow us to come together just to give back to you, Lord. We ask all in your son Jesus' name. Amen. The song after the lesson will be number 940, Only a Step. Now, if it's comfortable, please stand. 648. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross, lift up his royal banner. It must not suffer long from Verse two, but are we going to march into battle or just kind of slump our way? March. We're going to march and we're going to go. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The trumpet call obey.
All right, good morning, church. Morning. The scripture reading will be uh, read by Zephyr for, on Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. We'll get into that. And they shall come back, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites, Amorites is not yet complete. Amen. Thank you, Zephyr. So today, we're going to talk about the God of the Israelite conquest. And I picked this topic and, and discussion with several of our members. And, you know, um, I think just overall, generally speaking, the churches don't speak about God of the Israelite conquest as often as uh, we ought to. And we shy away from this topic, um, although our church hasn't. And, and Gary is teaching on the book of Joshua. And we're thankful for that, uh, for his knowledge on it. And... Are his teachings on that. However, um, just overall, generally speaking, we shy away from top, the topic because we uh, there are outsiders who accuse God of committing genocide, and that really uh, bothers us. You know, and when they accuse our God of such thing, uh, we don't know what to say in defense of uh, such accusation, and we don't know how to teach our children when when our children ask such difficult questions. So for the next two weeks, my um, focus will be on going through these six lesson points. So this week, we'll go through the first three, and then next week, we'll go through four through six, talking about the God of the Israelite conquest uh, through these lesson points. So was God's command uh, a hyperbole, or is it to be taken literally? Uh, and does God, what's God's prerogative as a creator? And what are the various sins of the Canaanites and his culture? And was God long-suffering? And imagining, number five, what would have been, it would have been like if God did not command the Israelites to destroy the Canaanites? And six, we're going to talk about God as a foundation of morality. And so, as you can see, the following two sermons won't sound like a sermon, but sound more like a lesson. Okay. However, I think this is very important for not only you to know how to uh, combat some of the accusations that we get, but also for you to teach your children when they come of age and can uh, logically and rationally go through these difficult topics with you, that you are equipped to teach them, or at least give them some reasons to believe, well, no, perhaps God is not a moral monster, but God was just in his ordering of the destruction of the Canaanites. So uh, that is what we're going to go over. Now, there is a disclaimer. There is a disclaimer. Uh, some of the things that I'm going to present are very graphic, okay? Especially when it comes to the, the sins of the Canaanites. And if you believe that you don't want your little ch child uh, to be exposed to that this early, uh, that is fine. I won't be offended if you take him or her outside. Okay, for uh, the sections or for this lesson. But at least this will be recorded and you can go back to it. And at least uh, hopefully you'll be equipped uh, with some of the uh, talking points here. Now we'll get into uh, point number one immediately. So there is a debate in the scholarly circle as to whether God's command to destroy the Canaanites were to be taken literally or as in hyperbole, okay? So when we read texts like Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 6, uh, I'll read this for you. It says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, the Gergeshites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. And going on, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. 
This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. So we have this text that seems to say, well, we've got to destroy everything and anything that the Canaanites held on to, including themselves. And chapter 20, 16 through 18, if you look at the context of the chapter 20, uh, is how we conduct an ethical war. How, how should the Israelites conduct an ethical war? And it goes from talking about war against the foreign nations. However, uh, 16 through 18 deals specifically about the nations that are in Canaan. So there is a big however here. There is a difference in posture. However, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance that is, a Can that is Canaan. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. If you look just a couple of verses above, it lists things like uh, men, women, children, uh, livestock. So talking about everything here, completely destroy them. The Hittites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Parasites, Hivites, and the Jebusites as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. And if you look at these verses, it seems like God is very serious about eradicating the Canaanites. Okay? And let's turn to Joshua. And Joshua seems to say that he has completed all the works that God has commanded him. So Joshua subdued the whole region. Chapter 10, verse 40, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, and the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua subdued them from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza, from the whole region of Goshen to Gibeon. All these kings and their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. And Joshua eleven fifteen says, as the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua and Joshua did it. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So these verses coupled with the above text from Deuteronomy uh, make it sound like Joshua killed off all men, women, children, and livestock with no survivors. There is no Canaan no more. Yet, however, if you turn to the same book a little later, when Joshua is old, in his own words, he talks about survivors. So that's puzzling. So let's take a look. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until the, you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. And if you turn to the book of Judges, chapter 1, it lists tribes of Israel failing to drive out the Canaanites over and over again, and they intermingle with the Canaanites, and you know what happens, the rest is history. Uh, Israelites are influenced by the Canaanites and they, uh, by the times of the prophets, they commit all sorts of abhorrent practices following their cousins in the Canaan, in the land of Canaan. So reading through Joshua, we also see many who are spared, such as Rahab and her father's household, who hid the two spies, and the entire Gibeonites who made treaty with them get spared. Of course, they have to conform to the Israelite culture and throw away their Canaanite past. But you can see they were not eradicated on the basis of their national origin or their cultural background, which makes the claim that God conducted a complete genocidal eradication of the Canaanites somewhat a moot point. So how do we take Deuteronomy 7 and Joshua 10 and 11 and Joshua 23 and Judges all together. How do we make sense of that? Well, if you look at the context of the ancient Near East, they had what was called the pre-battle speech. Okay? And it was common during the pre-battle speeches for to use hyperbole a little bit. So you may think, uh, you may think about how 
in, in sports, the coach might tell the team to go wipe the other team out. If he were to take in that literally, well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't really have a sportsmanlike ship sport, right? However, uh, there is a hyperbole there when they want to pump them up for what is to come. Now, if you look back and look closely in Deuteronomy chapter 7, the same text we talk, uh, God talks about how the Israelites are to completely destroy them all. So if following uh, verse 17, so actually turn there, please. The question the Israelites have in Deuteronomy 7 is not on the method of how to carry out the command, but on their ability or perceived incompetence against these nations, against these perceived, perceivably stronger nations. So God says, if you say to yourself, these nations are greater than I, how can I drive them out? Verse 17. Verse 18, do not be afraid of them. Be sure to remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and all of Egypt. The great trials that you saw, the signs and wonders, the strong hand and outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. The Lord your God will do the same to all the peoples you fear. So the purpose of chapter 7 is to, as before, as before they go into battle with these Canaanites who seem to be stronger, God wants to give them confidence that they can, they can destroy them with his help. Now, now, do not get me wrong. I'm not saying that the Israelites did not wage war with them and did not kill many Canaanites. Nor am I saying that God was not serious about eliminating Canaan, the Canaanite footprints in the promised land. He was, he was surely bent on driving them out and destroying them from the land that he promised to Israel. But the picture the skeptics often paint is that the Israelites somehow trapped all the Canaanites and all of the inhabitants in their own cities and killed off these people who were not willing to fight. And that any survivor who escaped were pursued until they were hacked. That's not the picture that is painted if you look closely. And also the Bible alternates using the words destroy and drive out when talking about the Israelite conquest of Canaan. So the Israelites aren't focusing on killing every single one of the Canaanites until the end of the world. They're focused on cleansing the land of the debased culture. You have to also be reminded that the Canaanites were not innocent people either. They waged war against other nations. They conquered. They practice abhorrent practices. And to paint them to be a, an innocent victim, that in itself is twisting history. They were not a peaceful nation before the Israelites came to town, became their neighbor. So what do we conclude from this? Well, yeah, there are some hyperbole, typical of the genre, if you just look at Joshua and Deuteronomy and Judges. And the focus is more on eradicating the base culture than killing every single person on the basis of their national origin. Okay. And also in Joshua chapter 11, uh, if you look through, there is talks about how the Israelites took away the livestock instead of killing all everything that breathed. Okay. But still the question remains, were the Canaanites deserving of their punishment? And we'll get there, but first we have to visit an often overlooked aspect of this problem. Who is God and what is his prerogative? So this leads us to point two, God's prerogative as a creator of all things. No, many skeptics do not possess an accurate view of who God is and what he's capable of and what his prerogatives are. Uh, even some Christians don't have that accurate picture. And so many atheists poke fun at God and make him out to be a human-like being, uh, an advanced being who wields more power than humans, but someone who is fickle and who has emotional instability and who is a primitive tribal God who stuck to a specific region, who did not possess 
much greater moral value than a typical human being. And they certainly don't ascribe to him the creator, the title, the creator of the universe. So from the beginning, as they tackle this problem, the moral problem of the destruction of the Canaanites, they hold, they bring this low view of God subconsciously or consciously. And certainly if that's the view of God one holds, the outrage is understandable. So let me illustrate this in this way. Imagine you're talking with somebody and he tells you a family of five human beings. Just one day without his approval, just barged into his home and will not leave. So he says, you know what? I'm going to kill them off and destroy their belongings and throw them out. Would you be appalled? Yeah. If you're not, I worry about you. Okay. You would be. Now imagine the same scenario, but with a family of chimps. Genetically speaking, they are the closest cousins to humans, scientists say, and they're not like humans in many ways. Would you still be appalled? I think many of us still will be. Now, how about a family of mice and rats? What about gnats and fruit flies, mosquitoes, bed bugs? Would you be appalled? Where do you draw the line? What about the bacteria in your homes? Do you think twice about spraying your antibacterial sprays around your home to kill these bacteria? 99.9% .9 kill rate? Sounds funny until we compare ourselves to God. So how do we size up God? How do we size up God? So if you're going to judge God for his actions according to the Bible, then we also must look at how the Bible describes God to determine his prerogatives, right? And the biblical account states that he is the creator of all things, the starry host and the earth, right? So this is a recent picture from the James Webb Telescope that NASA published. And uh, previously we had pictures of the space from the Hubble Telescope. And we know the space to be massive, right? But let's, let's look at what the Bible says first. Okay. If you turn to 1 King chapter 8. This is a Solomon's prayer and dedication of the temple that he built to God and he prays to God. Chapter 8, verse 27, it says, But will God indeed live on earth? Well, that was the purpose, right, of the temple. The temple was to be the house of God. But Solomon, who was the architect and the builder of the temple, doesn't think so. Even heaven, the highest heaven, cannot contain you, much less this temple I built. Even the Israelites believed that God cannot be contained within a vessel created by humans. Not even the highest heavens, the heaven they believe to be uh, concurrent with the sky, the starry hosts, they cannot contain God. He is the creator God. So let's actually size up. How about we look at humans to bacteria, okay? So they say typically humans contain up on average about 37 trillion cells, that average is in size of 10 micrometers, okay? A size of a bacterial cell, bacteria is a single cell organism, range from 0.2 to two micrometers. Now let's use a smaller number for the dramatic effect, the 0.2 micrometers, and compare it to the average size of 10 micrometers. You can say human cells are up to 50 times bigger than a bacteria. So you do 50 times 37 trillion cells and you get the difference of one quadrillion and 850 trillion in size. So a human being is one quadrillion and 850 trillion times bigger than a bacterial cell. 
Well, let's size us up with the things that are bigger than us. They say the earth is about 3.5 million times larger than a human. And our solar system is about 36 billion times larger than earth. If you do the math, 3.5 million times 36 billion, just our solar system alone to a human, that difference is greater than a human to a bacteria cell difference. Now NASA estimates that there are over 100 billion stars in just our galaxy, the Milky Way. And they estimate, the estimates of the galaxies in the universe range from billions to trillions. Just from the size difference, I think we can say the difference between the universe and the human is much bigger than the difference between humans and the bacterial cells. Do you agree? Now to this, we have to add the fact that God is not just bigger in size. The Bible claims that he is a creator of all these things that we can observe. And God as a creator of all things has a prerogative to destroy all things. And quite frankly speaking, he can do whatever he wants if he wished to. And if he, if he should say, you know what? I, don't, I just don't like human beings one day and wipe the human beings from the face of the earth, that is within his prerogative. Do you consider the bacteria you're killing? Do you consider the rodents, the mice, the rats, before you call the exterminators? God has the prerogative to destroy what he has created. Yet what is crazy about God is that the God of the Bible the God of the universe, the God who is a creator, puts a limit on himself by his own words, by his promises. And he gives people the standard to follow and only destroys when the people became so depraved and so wicked. The God that we're dealing with is a God who will spare Sodom and Gomorrah if there are just five righteous people. Now, do you do that with bacteria? Do you do that with rodents and mice? Deuteronomy 9, 4 through 5. After the, Lord, after the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, it is on, on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going in to take possession of their land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, if you remember, during Abraham's time, they were believers of God in the land of Canaan. One example of that is Melchizedek. Okay? So they had knowledge of God, that they had become so depraved. And so God acts upon his promise, right? He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he also acts upon the standard that he has published. These people are being driven out because of their wickedness. So what were their wickedness comprised of? What were their specific sins? Specifically, if you could categorize their sins, they could be categorized into these um, categories. Idolatry, incest, adultery, child sacrifice, homosexuality, and pederasty. Pederasty being love of boys, okay, having sexual relations with young boys. Uh, bestiality, that is having sexual relations with animals. Okay? So all these things the Canaanites committed. So idolatry is a foundation for all of the Canaanite practices that is listed over there from incest to bestiality. It leads to polytheism, first of all, if you have idolatry. And even when deities are contrary to each other, they try to um, amalgamate, uh, amalgamate those beliefs. And when all beliefs become okay, then eventually not, nothing becomes not okay. And that's why you get adultery, child sacrifice, bestiality, homosexuality, pederasty, all these things. Let's talk about, in, 
I think I forgot to add the incest part. Okay, well, let's talk about incest. The Canaanite pantheon was incestuous. So the Canaanite gods were incestuous. Their creator god was the god El, the father of the gods. He has 70 children by his consort or his wife, Asherah. We know that name by Asherah poles, right? To be destroyed. Baal, Baal or Baal was one of them of the 70 children of El. And he has sexual relations with his sister, Anat. Baal also has his first daughter as his consort. And none of these facts are presented pejoratively. And if you look at early Canaanite laws, they prescribe either death or banishment for most forms of incest. However, after the 14th century BC, the penalties were reduced to no more than the payment of a fine. And interestingly enough, those time corresponds to the time when God has told Abraham the iniquities of the Amorites has not yet reached its completion. And you see from typical um, other dream books from the area, surrounding areas like Egypt, incest was also uh, not looked at pejoratively. So they were trying to decipher some uh, dreams for people. And these dream books have this one saying where if you dream of having a sexual relations with your mother, that's a good omen. If you dream of having a sexual relations with your sister, that's a good omen. If you dream of having sexual relations with your daughter, that's a good omen. However, if you dream of having a sexual relation with a woman, that is a bad omen. Okay. That is the kind of culture that was surrounding Canaan and the surrounding um, cultures. Incest was okay. Adultery. Canaanite religion, like all other ancient Near Eastern religion, was a fertility religion that involved temple sex. Okay. And, you know, there is a story in the Ugaritic text I uh, cited over here, KTU 1.23, about their creator god, El, who has a wife, Asherah, try, overcomes impotence and captures two women engaging in lesbian sex, however, by the way, and then pregnancy. him. Then each of them give birth to a son and their name Dawn and Dusk. This is their mythology. And the story is followed by this direction to be repeated five times by the company and the singers of the assembly. And one Scholar notes that we may well suppose that this activity of L was sacramentally experienced by the community in the sexual orgies of the fertility cult, which the Hebrew prophets so vehemently denounced. And one interesting fact is adultery was against the law for married women, but not for men. Whether married un or unmarried. And when a married woman commits adultery, it was an offense to her husband, and the husband can condone it or accept compensation from the man who had an adulterous relationship with his wife. That was the kind of culture that the Canaanites had. And of course, we have evidence of child sacrifice. I think we have the most amount of evidence about child sacrifice than any other things are listed here. Uh, Leviticus 18.21 says, do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech. Molech was a Canaanite underworld deity represented by an upright bullheaded idol with, human, with a human body and in whose belly a fire was stoked and in whose outstretched arm a child was placed that will be burned to death. And we have evidence of such practices from extra biblical authors and also archaeological um, discoveries. They estimate that at times, 
thousands of children were burned to death at once. And this is Plutarch talking about the Carth Carthaginians who, who are uh, actually people who have settled in Carthage in northern parts of Africa who have come from Phoenicia. And so they're Phoenician people and Phoenician people are a name given to the Canaanites by the Greek people. Okay, so these are, they're the same people culturally and Plutarch comments on, on them and how um, they sacrifice their own children. And uh, the practice in Carthage continued until about 143 BC until Carthage fell. So he says, no, but with full knowledge and understanding, they themselves offered up their own children and those who had no children would buy little ones from poor people and cut their throats as if they were so many lambs or young birds. Meanwhile, the mother stood by without a tear or a moan, but should she utter a single moan or let fall a single tear, she had to forfeit the money. Talking about the poor woman. And her child was sacrificed nevertheless. And the whole area before the statue was filled with a loud noise of flutes and drums so that the cries of wailing should not reach the ears of the people. You know, if, that's disgusting, if you ask me. And it wasn't just infants, it was children up to four. Children up to four at times by thousands. Imagine that for hundreds of years. Homosexuality and pederasty. Leviticus 18 says this, you must not do as they do in Egypt where you used to live and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan where I'm bringing you. Do not follow their practices. And this, is, this chapter is where um, he talks about not giving your children to Moloch, because that's the kind of practice that the Canaanites practice. And at verse 22, following that, it says this, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. No ancient Near Eastern text condemns homosexuality. And there was a popular cult in those days called the Ishtar or Ashtar uh, cult. And this goddess Ishtar was a goddess of fertility, adultery, anything sexual related, okay? And, uh, and, there, and her temples were male cult functionaries who dressed up as females. So they wore makeup, female makeups and they wore female clothes and they participated in ritual homosexual uh, intercourse. And they were typically boys, young boys. Okay. And so no ancient Near Eastern culture condemns that. And the Bible says that Canaanites have uh, conducted these kind of behaviors. And finally, bestiality. So in the 1900s, they have discovered what's called the Ba'ar cycle, which lists um, some of the accomplishments of Baal and his life, which is a god. And in this Baal cycle, we see this text here. So this is their god, their strongest god, supreme god. Baal overthrows El and takes the supreme position. Mightiest Baal hears, he makes love with a heifer in the outback, a cow in the field of death's realm. He lies with her 70 times seven, mounts 80 times eight. She conceives and bears a boy. And of course, in the surrounding culture, such as the Egyptian or the um, Babylonian magic text, we see um, people using bestiality to kind of, uh, to cure impotence of men. And we see, we hear of dream books talking about and interpreting the kind of dreams that people dreamt in Egypt. And if a man were to dream about having sexual intercourse with an animal that was a good woman, but if he were to have a sexual intercourse with a regular woman, that was a bad woman. 
Now, I can't imagine a culture where you dream about having sexual intercourse with an animal. And that tells me that was practiced widely in those cultures. These were the sins of the Canaanites. These were the sins of the Canaanites. Yet God is long suffering. And he tells Abraham, you know what? Their wickedness, their sin has not yet reached its full measure. God shows his justice in his mercy. And he waits until it becomes so depraved that God has to act. Next week, we're going to talk more about God's long suffering. And that God really does put special care upon human beings. And talk about how we are not long suffering when it comes to our offenses. We're going to talk about what if God did not command the destruction of the Canaanite cities? We have seen that with the city of Carthage, hundreds of years with child sacrifices. Can you imagine how many children have died? We're going to talk about that. What was worse? What is worse? And we're going to talk about God as the foundation of morality. Without God, we commit these kind of atrocities. God is a long-suffering God. God was just in destroying the Canaanites. And we ought to imagine from a different angle what, would it, what it would have been like in the land of Canaan without God's intervention. Now, I end our lesson here today. It was a long lesson. Thank you for listening. And I want to uh, extend an invitation. If you ever had a thought or a question or doubt about God's justice in dealing with the Canaanites, if you still have questions and you want to discuss this with any of us, we invite you forward. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn more, we ask that you come back next week. Mm -hmm. In any case, we ask that you stand up to, together with us and praise a God of justice, a God of grace, and God of mercy. Let's stand up and sing together. I am the way, I am the love, all day, I'm for He loves you so, only a step, only a step, I'm for He
Give you a few minutes to look at our prayer list. And we would really like to um, welcome Lotus to our family. It's a really good thing that she's now part of God's family. And we also want you to probably think about the gentleman that's been put up for a deacon and um, just pray about that. And since I'm doing the closing prayer, I have my prerogative to add a few people to this list, even though it's already long. Um, Bob McNeely, which is Wayne McNeely's dad, has lung cancer that has metastasized. So Wayne and Cindy are actually in Oregon right now um, to spend some time with him. And my sister, Nancy, is going to be having her cancer surgery on the 9th of August. And... My daughter, Nicole, I can't, I can't say her last name, Ignani, Ignat, whatever. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to say. Um, she is pregnant and she, hopefully that she has a healthy pregnancy and delivery. Um, she unfortunately got high blood pressure from, her, from me and her mother's side of the family. So she's kind of worried about that and her doctor is a little bit. So let's just have them in your prayers that everything will work out fine in regards to that. And also um, prayer for me as I may have to have another neck surgery because it's acting up again. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning thanking you for this time we've had to come and worship you and just thank you so much for your son, for his sacrifice and we know that that was something that we don't merit but yet you and your son were willing to go through that for us we pray that we will be the people that you died for that we will bring others to you and that we will be examples of what a christian should be according to your word. We ask that you'll be with all those that are having health issues, that you will be with them and bring them back to their health if it be your will and be with doctors and nurses and those that are administering unto them that they're, through their knowledge through you that they'll be able to help when needed. We thank you so much for Lotus being baptized and joining your family. And we just pray that you'll be with her and be with all of us as we will we'll be examples of what it's like to be in your family. And we just pray that you'll be with all those that need spiritual guidance, that you'll guide us in a way that you see fit, that we will be able to be comforted, be able to be guided by your word to do your will. And be with those that are traveling, that they'll get back to back to where they're going safely. And we just pray that you'll be with us as we leave this place, that we go back out in this world, that we will, like I said before, that we'll be examples of what you have us to be so that we can bring others into your fold. And this is my prayer in your son's Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 